the paper, although it will indeed be focused on John Locke, will be partly in the spirit of the history manifesto in the sense that I'm going to begin in the present, right now, uh, and I will ultimately go back via Locke, I think, only as far as Cicero, but then it's mostly going to be in the 17th century. So I know we have a range of people from different periods and places here. There's almost something for everybody here. And I should also say, if anybody has time on their hands, the History, the History Manifesto has not been translated into French yet, <laughs> even though Fernand Braudel was the great inspiration behind uh, that book. So if you fancy a little task for the weekend afternoons, uh, we'd be exceedingly glad to have uh, uh, the Manifeste d'Histoire uh, distributed uh, on this side of the channel. Uh, just a hint. So let me begin, as I say, in the present. I'm going to stand uh, and talk from here so that you can see whatever images uh, flash up. I don't want to get in the way of the well-chosen images. Actually, this one here, uh, some of you, if you're Lockeans, may recognize that this portrait of John Locke emerged only in the last year. Uh, it is uh, by a Scottish doctor, a friend of his, and emerged in a Scottish castle uh, only in, in recent months. I'm not sure where it is or who has bought it since, but it's uh, remarkably lively uh, and also somewhat intimidating uh, picture of Locke himself. This is the way I think of John Locke as penetrating and overbearing, slightly enigmatic, and indeed I will come to an enigma in the two treatises in just one moment. So now with the, oh, we don't have a clicker, do we? I don't think we do. So alas, I cannot stand. I will have to uh, put myself on front of the screen uh, in order to advance the slides. So with the benefit of hindsight, I think it's now fair to say that the 2016 referendum on whether the United Kingdom should leave the European Union, uh, the results of that have been almost entirely negative. In fact, I can't think of any positives uh, to this. Maybe some of you in the room can, but I suspect not. Three years and two days uh, since Britain's withdrawal from the European Union on the 31st of January 2020, I think it's now clear that Brexit has left the UK poorer, weaker and less respected on the world stage. It's ensured that the British economy has become less robust uh, during and after the pandemic and that it's been less resilient from recovering from the pandemic's effects. The so-called Northern Irish Protocol created a dividing line across the Irish Sea that bisects the United Kingdom internally and has brought devolved government in Northern Ireland to a complete standstill while also destabilising the British Union more generally. Former Prime Minister David Cameron complacently called the Brexit referendum supposedly to end divisions over Europe within his own party, while the results of his criminal insouciance have been deeper party divisions, a succession of premiers who have been undone by Brexit, most notably Theresa May and Boris Johnson, and the spreading of the Brexit poison into the bloodstream of British politics at Westminster and nationally. In one area, however, this may be the one saving grace related to my paper, in one area Brexit may have had a positive effect, at least potentially. This is in the matter of the parliamentary scrutiny of treaties. As part of the internal Conservative Party wrangling over the passage of the so-called withdrawal agreement in 2019 from the European Union, Tory MPs demanded and got the right to what they called a meaningful vote on that particular instrument, the withdrawal agreement from the EU. Amid all the smoke and noise of domestic politics in Britain after 2016, it was sometimes easy to forget that the process of Britain's withdrawal from the European Union took place under the terms of one treaty, specifically under the terms of Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, and that it would be put into effect by means of another treaty, the withdrawal agreement itself. So contested were the terms of that, that latter treaty, the withdrawal agreement, that suspicious members of parliament required of their government the right to vote on its provisions. This was the mechanism of, again, the so-called meaningful vote that more far-reachingly than ever before in British history gave the legislative, that is parliament, the power to scrutinize, delay, and possibly even reject a treaty an instrument of the executive that would usually have been entirely outside the competence of that legislative of parliament to debate, let alone to delay or to disrupt. The United Kingdom is what lawyers call a dualist country with respect to treaties. 
That is, unlike in, say, the Netherlands or the United States, treaties once ratified do not immediately become part of domestic law, but need to be separately incorporated in legislation. This is because, and this is the key point which is going to link us to Locke, this is because under the British Constitution, treaty making is a prerogative power of the Crown. The sovereign, the king, as, he, as it is now, or until recently the queen, has of course not personally exercised that power of treaty making since the 17th century. It has instead been vested in the sovereign's ministers. That is entirely in the executive branch of government rather than the legislative. That said, for almost a century, since 1924, governments have, as it's uh, said in English legal parlance, laid treaties before Parliament for 21 days of scrutiny between their signature with other powers and their final ratification. That convention was strengthened in 2010 with the passage of the so-called Constitutional Reform and Government Governance Act which allowed the House of Commons at least to delay ratification uh, an earlier stage before the meaningful vote uh, provision of 2019. But even that turned out not to be enough for the headbangers of the Tory right, who demanded that meaningful vote in the case of with withdrawal agreement, thereby redrawing the boundaries between the executive and the legislative, between government and parliament, in the implementation of international treaties. Now I begin with this still remarkably simplified account of highly complex constitutional matters in Britain to put into sharper relief a puzzle from the 17th century. This is a puzzle based on two innovations in one of the least examined chapters of what became one of the century's most canonical works of political thought. That is, John Locke's Two Treatises of Government, published in late 1689 as a justification for the Glorious Revolution, but as scholars have pointed out for 60 years now, uh, the work was originally written in the context of the exclusion crisis of the late 1670s and early 1680s. So Locke's original intentions were, in fact, quite distinct from and more radical than uh, his intentions in publishing the work in 1689. And the layers of radicalism within uh, the two treatises of government have been much debated, though there's very little external evidence to allow us to, as it were, take apart uh, the work itself. So what I'm going to say uh, is relevant both to that earlier stage, the original stage of the writing, the drafting, the writing of the work, and also of its publication uh, in 1689. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the puzzle in uh, chapter 12 of uh, the second treatise of government as uh, the puzzle of the federative. Those are my words, uh, not John Locke's words, though the word federative, as we'll see in a moment, was indeed one of Locke's own words, a neologism or near-neologism in 17th century English. That puzzle of the federative appears in one of the shortest chapters of the two treatises of government, chapter 12. In that chapter, Locke describes the separation of powers. As the title of the chapter itself has it, and you can see it on the bottom right here, chapter 12 of the legislative, executive, and federative power of the Commonwealth. Now, if this chapter isn't right at the forefront of your mind, I'll just run through briefly the structure of Locke's argument so you can see how he separates powers, and then also I'll show why his separation of powers was both very unusual, indeed unprecedented, at the time uh, he made this tripartite separation of powers, and also why that separation of powers would also be unique, that is, not just unprecedented, but unimitated by any of Locke's followers. And that's part of the puzzle. Uh, why does he do something that he knew to be completely novel uh, in separating powers in the way that he did? And then with a longer perspective, as we say in English, with a long durée perspective on this, uh, we can see that his innovation actually didn't take hold. So why did he do it and why did it not take hold are among uh, the questions I want to try and answer here. So again, just to walk you through uh, his argument uh, to remind you or to uh, uh, perhaps for the first time to show you the, the nature of his argument there, his separation of powers, I'll, I'll do that now in the next couple of minutes. Uh, 
In this chapter, Locke argues that the separation of the first two of these three powers, that is the legislative and executive, terms I've already used and are still current uh, in describing the British Constitution, the American Constitution, and others, of course, he decided that those two powers uh, had to be separated for two connected reasons. Those two connected reasons were time, temporality, we might say, and function, functionality. That is the speed at which the dif different kinds of political decision had to be made and the agency that would make them, or in the case of laws, that would end up enforcing those legislative divisions, uh, decisions. Locke explains that making laws takes only a relatively short time, even though the laws that were produced had to have what he called a constant and lasting force. That being the case, legislation demands two agencies working at two speeds, one comparatively swift and intermittent, a legislative, the English Parliament, meeting sometimes only for weeks at a time with long periods, months and sometimes actually years, even decades, in between its meetings, the other longer lasting, something that can enforce the laws when the legislature was not actually meeting. Even laws made rapidly would have to have that constant and lasting force and therefore some agency, a permanent, perpetual agency, uh, which would be able to give force to the legislation made even if relatively swiftly. Now it's certainly conceivable, he argues, that a single agent could both make laws swiftly and enforce them enduringly. However, he went on, that may be, quotes, too great a temptation to human frailty apt to grasp a power, that is to have a kind of tyrannical dictator who can make laws very rapidly on the fly and then have the power to enforce them. He says that's not the kind of solution that we're looking for. That way would lead to tyranny and dictatorship. In a well-ordered commonwealth like the one he is imagining, it would be necessary to separate the lawmaking function from the law enforcing function. The first of those separated powers would be what Locke unsurprisingly calls the legislative power. The persons, he says, who duly assembled gather to make law for the public good and then having done that, separate again to be the subject of the laws that they have made. So that's the legislative power. Again, imagine the English Parliament meeting for a few, few weeks, making laws, and then everybody going back to their homes and their constituencies. However, to put the laws in action, there would have to be a power always in being which is, should see to the execution of the laws that are made and remain in force, and thus the legislative and executive power come often to be separated, he said. So that's a, it's an empirical op, op, uh, observation, but it's based on this two-speed uh, formation and execution of law and then the necessity both to have intermittent, relatively rapid, uh, very nimble uh, lawmaking happening punctually and intermittently for short periods of time, and then a longer lasting enduring agency to enforce the laws that have made. So that's legislative versus executive. We put that to one side for the moment to come on to uh, his, his, his third uh, division. By the time that Locke wrote in the 1680s, it was quite conventional already and had been since the 1640s within English political thought to discriminate between the two powers in this way, the legislative and the executive, as his predecessors Charles Dallison, James Harrington, George Lawson, Philip Hunton, and others had done since uh, the English Civil War. Uh, there's relatively little separation of powers theory before the 1640s, but by the time Locke's writing in the 1680s, this is pretty much the orthodoxy in English political thought, even among absolute as well as those we might think of as having more democratic leanings in their political thinking. What was unprecedented at the time that Locke wrote, however, was the addition of this third power, the one he calls the federative. In chapter 12, he defines the federative as, quotes, the power of war and peace, leagues and alliances, and all the transactions with all persons and community without the Commonwealth. And I stress that word without uh, because it means in 17th century English outside the Commonwealth. So all transactions with all persons and communities outside the Commonwealth or outside the state as we might now say. 
Again, even absolutist thinkers had denied that there were more than two divisions of power, legislative and executive, so no one else before Locke wrote had divided power uh, uh, with a third cut, as it were, uh, to define this separate uh, externally directed uh, power of war, peace, leagues, alliances, and transactions with uh, ex external powers and sovereigns. And Locke himself acknowledged that this was an innovation. As he went on uh, in uh, the passage from chapter 12, uh, he admitted that this third power may be called federative if anyone pleases. So the thing be understood, I am indifferent as to the name. So, just to sum up, here were Locke's two innovations. First, the neologism, or near-neologism, federative itself, and he recognized this was an unusual word. And second, its referent, that third, and at this point uh, in 17th century English history, so far unprecedented power that he had added to the already existing separation of powers made by other theorists, of the legislative and the executive. So there are two innovations here that need to be explained, though they're basically the same one. A new function that he isolates, and then the new word that he uses to describe that. Anyone looking back at John Locke from, say, Montesquieu, or much later Madison, with their doctrines of the separation of powers in mind, might have expected the third leg of Locke's uh, stool to be the judicial power alongside the legislative and the executive. And of course, that's not the case. Instead, Locke specifies the federative as the third power in every commonwealth or state, which one may call natural, because it is that which answers to the power every man naturally had before he entered into society. And we'll come back to that in a second. Why does he think this federative power is a natural power? Moreover, again, thinking comparatively, anyone looking forward to Locke from, say, Bodin, the late 16th century, or Harrington in the mid-17th century, or even simply, in fact, recalling earlier chapters of the Second Treatise of Government itself, would imagine, uh, by talking in these terms about a natural power, that he was talking about the power to judge and to punish again, the judicial power, which he does describe in exactly the same terms, that the natural power of self-preservation that we have in the state of nature carries over into the civil state after we've made a social contract so that we continue to retain that right of uh, judging uh, and punishing, however, uh, it is now uh, in the hands of the executive power rather than separated out from it as a, se as a distinct judicial power. So again, something, something mysterious if you're looking from uh, 18th century constitutional theory of the separation of powers, something mysterious if you're looking forward from the late 16th century and theories of sovereignty and divided sovereignty as well. So there's something funny going on here uh, that, we, that we need to explain. And strangely, uh, there is very little written about this, even in the vast pullulating body of scholarship on John Locke. This is not a problem uh, that uh, has attracted very much attention. I think it should and I hope you'll be convinced it's worth paying some attention to uh, as I go through this talk. The third power, the federative, uh, endures the transition from the state of nature to civil society because it is, as Locke says, in reference to the rest of mankind. Beyond the Commonwealth, beyond the state, its, uh, its members have contracted to join, although, as he puts it, they make one body, which is, as every member of it before was, is still in the state of nature with respect to the rest of mankind. A natural power remains, which manages all the controversies in that, as we would now say, international, interstate, perhaps interpolity state of nature, and responds to any collective injury done to the Commonwealth, to the body uh, of uh, the state and its inhabitants. And this power, again, uh, Locke uh, uh, puts it, this power contains the power of war and peace, leagues and alliances, and all the transactions with all persons and communities without the Commonwealth as a collective uh, power directed outwardly to other sovereign bodies, uh, and I'll specify the range of those sovereign bodies in a moment, uh, in the same way that individuals in the interpersonal state of nature retain that ability to make contracts, covenants, alliances, treaties, without which we wouldn't have a social contract, the central feature of Locke's second treatise at all. And I'll come back in conclusion to 
the relationship between treaty making on the one hand and the social contract tradition on the other, because I think that relationship has been fundamentally misunderstood. And this concentration on the federative in the second treatise helps us to rethink the relationship between those two forms of uh, engagement under trust, treaties on the one hand, contracts, particularly the social contract, on the other. Now again, Locke's term for the power he was describing there, federative, was, as I've described it, a near neologism, though I think one that would have been uh, easily recognizable for anybody with a classical education like John Locke himself. I say near neologism because the word had appeared just once in English before Locke himself used it in a 1653 pamphlet by uh, the proponent of child baptism, Henry Whistler. Whistler's pamphlet here, uh, entitled Aim at an Upshot for Infant Baptism by the Goodwill of Christ, referred to covenantal salvation using the term federative. So he's using it in a specifically theological sense, not in the secular, political, outwardly directed sense that, that Locke uses the term. So I don't think there's any relationship, there's no evidence that Locke knew of this pamphlet, there's no evidence that he picked up the term uh, from uh, this very specific and, as far as I can tell, unique usage here. But nonetheless, the root the etymological link between Locke's uh, usage and um, uh, uh, Henry Whistler's usage goes back to the Latin term foidera, which is the plural of foidos, the word which uh, in the law of nations refers to treaties, but more generally in Latin refers to any kind of covenant, contract, or agreement. So in the case of uh, Henry Whistler, a theological writer, when he's writing about the federative, about something based upon foidera or agreements, he's talking about covenants, like the covenant between the people of Israel and God, uh, whereas Locke is talking about a different kind of agreement, the agreements that now generally we call treaties, uh, but they overlap uh, in the Latin, and that root federative is at the, is at the base of both. However, as far as, again, as far as I can tell, uh, there's no classical precedent for the use of that term. In all of classical Latin, no author uh, uses the word federativa, uh, for, it, for instance. Uh, in each case, Henry Whistler uh, and then later John Locke invented it using their knowledge of Latin to describe the particular different kinds of agreement uh, that each of them was dealing with. So just as Locke defined the separation between the legislative and the executive powers temporally, fast and slow, intermittent and permanent, so he described the federative in functional terms, yet also distinguished it spatially as treating matters outside of civil society and within the international, or again, interpolity state of nature. Now, there was one final twist in Locke's treatment of this subject before he left the subject of the federative power. And we're still in chapter 12 of the second treatise. Uh, he, in fact, collapsed the three powers, executive, legislative, and federative, back into two before he left his discussion. The executive, he argued, was charged with the exercise of law within the Commonwealth, within the state, and the federative with the management of the security and interest of the public outside it. He said, again, these two powers, executive and federative, were functionally distinct, but, he went on, they would nonetheless have to be joined in practice in the same person or the same body. Antecedent standing positive laws, he wrote, could direct the executive as municipal laws precede any actions taken in light of them, for example, in the courts. By contrast, no such laws could determine the actions of, of the federative, which he described as a, a reactive power, a power, that is, that responded to the actions of others, to the designs and interests of, quotes, foreigners. So standing laws, he said, direct the executive in its actions, the prudence and wisdom of those whose hands it is in, to be managed for the public good, steer the federative. And yet, Locke admits in the conclusion to this discussion, although those two powers, executive and federative again, remain functionally distinct, they're hardly to be separated and placed at the same time in the hands of distinct persons. Because, he argued, they both depend on the force of the state itself for its exercise, and in an almost Hobbesian twist, he argues that they could not be placed under, 
quotes, different commands, because that might divide the Commonwealth ruinously against itself. So in the end, he has a separation of powers without a separation of persons, or rather a separation of the legislative on the one hand and the executive and the federative in tandem with each other uh, on the other hand. So the puzzle of the federative, to, to sum up at this point, has three dimensions. One historiographical, one historical, and the other functional. In relation to the historiography, as one scholar has recently written, it remains a mystery why this part of Locke's theory has not received more attention. And I'll res return to that briefly in my conclusion. Secondly, the historical problem is why did Locke innovatively propose the federative as one of the separate powers directing the Commonwealth at all? No one else had done this before, no one was going to do it after him, so why did Locke find it necessary to do this? And third, why having added this new division to the tradition of separate, separate powers that he inherited from the 1640s onwards, why did Locke immediately collapse it back into a single and conjoined agency? Now, Locke himself effectively answered that third question a few paragraphs later in chapter 13 of the second treatise, when he noted that just as the executive power is what he called ministerial and subordinate to the legislative, so is the federative. The legislative may again be intermittent, only meeting uh, every so often, unlike the executive and the federative, which had to be permanent and perpetual, continuing powers of government. But the legislative was nonetheless supreme over both. The powers of the, legis of the executive and the federative arise from delegation from the legislative and could be resumed in the case of maladministration. That's going to be hugely important, of course, for the more radical, indeed revolutionary aspects of the Second Treatise, where he writes about the conditions under which the people can recover power to themselves when tyranny, maladministration, attacks upon their rights uh, come from their, uh, uh, from their sovereigns. Once again, the executive and the federative had to be united, both to avoid disorderly collisions between them and to make them equally responsible to the legislative for the orderly exercise of their functions. And, to conclude, there was a hierarchy among the three powers, with both executive and federative beneath the legislative power in uh, the, the structure of power as Locke laid it out in the two treatises of government. At the moment that Locke published the two treatises, 1689, early 1690, his normative account of this double-headed executive come legislative power uh, combined with the federative had the benefit of being empirically accurate as a description of the conjoined prerogatives of the English crown in the late 17th century. Indeed, one commentator, a legal commentator, has recently dis uh, called Locke's description, quotes, the best and most coherent explanation of exactly where things stood in relation to foreign affairs in the English constitution at the start of the modern era, even 80 years before Sir William Blackstone uh, provided the classic account of the separation of powers in his commentaries on the laws of England in the 1760s. However radical other aspects of Locke's two treatises may have been, this section of it, again quoting the same commentator, this section of it was both accurate and conservative in the context of late 17th century England. Now such praise, I think, goes part of the way in explaining why Locke felt it necessary to separate power in this way. It was simply that his analysis arose from and was aimed towards the circumstances of the English crown in the 1680s, both before the Glorious Revolution and during the course of that series of events. Earlier, Charles II had successfully struggled with Parliament to retain control of foreign affairs and treaty making, and the Glorious Revolution, in fact, did nothing to change that division of labour. Indeed, as we've already seen at the very beginning of this talk, over four centuries later, the federative, the power of war and peace, leagues and alliances, still remains a prerogative power of the crown, even though, uh, as I mentioned before, it's exercised on behalf of the crown by the crown's ministers, the government of the day sitting in parliament. Yet the question then still remains, why did Locke single out this particular function for special treatment and novel denomination? In the rest of this paper, I want to argue for another part of the answer to that question, drawing on Locke's own lifelong engagement with the early modern culture of treaties, foidera and treaty making, or the federative capacity. <laughs>
So let's uh, go through some other aspects of Locke's biography and also uh, material from the full range of his other writings, including his correspondence and his manuscripts. In some thoughts concerning education of 1693, Locke described the ideal credentials for entering public service in the cosmopolitan but conflicted world of late 17th century Europe. And here I quote, it's the quotation on the right here. A virtuous and well-behaved young man that is well-versed in the general part of the civil law, which concerns not the chicane of private cases, but the affairs and intercourse of civilized nations in general, grounded upon principles of reason, who understands Latin well and can write a good hand, one may turn loose into the world with great reassurance that he will find employment and esteem everywhere. Such a young man, if thoroughly schooled in Latin, and if he had the works of Hugo Grotius and Samuel Pufendorf on the Law of Nations always to hand, was the product of a series of convergent developments in the conduct of international affairs that occurred during Locke's own lifetime. Locke was born in the early 1640s, and it was in fact uh, right at that moment, in the early 1640s again, that a pan-European media revolution, especially in print, including the novel genre of newspapers, uh, and a revolution in the fabrication of informative compendia for the libraries of gentlemen and their sons, like, like Locke and the young man he's describing here, intensified and expanded knowledge of the affairs and intercourse of civilized nations among the educated. Cheap prints, available to wide readerships, appeared for the first time depicting scenes of the signature, ratification, and celebration of treaties. This is an early print uh, from uh, 1650, I believe, of the signing of uh, the, uh, the Peace of Munster in 1648. And I think one of the reasons why 1648 has become such a pivotal date, if not among historians, then in the other social sciences, is not that the Peace of Westphalia inaugurated the secular world of states which we still inhabit, but because it was the first big treaty negotiation that took place in the midst of this media revolution. So it became much better known than any previous similar negotiations and remains in the visual as well as political imagination deeper uh, than any other previous set of similar events. Prints like this depended on, again, another relatively new genre, uh, the artistic genre of treaty paintings, uh, which began to trickle out in the 16th century, but again become more general uh, as part of the rise of history painting, uh, modern history painting in the 17th century. Uh, this is the... Uh, the, the Somerset House Conference, England, Spain in 1604. And again, this is the original painting uh, of the, uh, the Peace of Munster in 1648 from which the print I just showed you came. Uh, treaty paintings, this relatively new genre, uh, uh, really burgeoning in the 1640s onwards, uh, moved in parallel with the first efflorescence of treaty music, which also began in the 1640s and became particularly popular from the 1680s uh, and uh, peaks and then finally dies in the 1820s. But composers such as Handel and Beethoven and Rossini, Campra and Rameau uh, composed treaty music during this period between the 1680s and the 1820s. And I should say that art historians have not studied treaty paintings as a genre, Musicologists have not studied treaty music as a genre, and in another project on the history of treaty making and treaty breaking seen through the lenses of cultural and intellectual history, I'm working on these genres in parallel with uh, other materials like the ones I'm dealing with here. With the rise of Louis XIV in particular, more formal training in the fundamentals of the law of nations and in the skills for effective diplomacy sharpened a repertoire of humanistic secretarial techniques more practically pointed towards semi-professional international relations, as we might call it, that were now being taught, and again this is from the 1680s onwards, now being taught in the emergent diplomatic academies or the ancient universities of France, Britain, and the Habsburg Empire. Louis XIV founds the first diplomatic academy the Habsburg Empire then follows. Uh, George I then uh, founds the two Regis professorships of history, the first endowed chairs of history in Britain at Oxford and Cambridge, precisely to educate diplomats, not to teach history, qua history, but to provide the basis for diplomatic decision making on the basis of uh, modern history itself. So in this period, period again of Locke's lifetime, 
understanding treaties, how they were negotiated and written, who had made them, how they were structured, uh, and how and, and how they uh, created what we might now call international society, was fundamental to all of these different activities and genre. As the French historian Amelot de la Housset put it in 1697, there are many thousand passages in history which are never rightly understood for want of being acquainted with the treaties on which they are grounded. John Locke would surely have agreed with that judgment. Indeed, his library contained a copy of de la Housset's Preliminaire des Traités, the original French text of 1697, in which that judgment appeared. And this was not a singular or unique piece of evidence for Locke's interest in treaties. Those crucial products of the federative power he found to be so newly and urgently characteristic of contemporary states in the late 17th century. Indeed, for almost 50 years, from the beginning of Locke's public life almost to the very end of it, he engaged with treaties in print and in manuscript, in negotiation and in application. That lifelong engagement with treaties, or foidera, again, I think brings into relief the significance of the federative within the separation of powers enumerated in the second treatise. That is, this arises from deep knowledge and engagement uh, of the actual function of government as Locke himself had experienced it. Locke's engagement with treaties long predated the two treatises, uh, indeed by over 30 years and continued after the last edition of that work, the third edition, that was published just before his death in 1704. Seen in that longer perspective, his novel analysis of the federative power in the Second Treatise appears within a sequence of actions and reflections made possible by the emerging and evolving treaty culture of his own time. That sequence began at the very beginning of Locke's public career and indeed initiated. Indeed, his very first appearance in print at the age of 22 was a celebration, two celebrations, in fact, of a treaty. In April 1654, the British Protectorate, as it then was, headed by Oliver Cromwell, signed the Treaty of Westminster with the Netherlands to conclude what would become known as the First Anglo-Dutch War. Shortly afterwards, the University of Oxford issued a congratulatory volume, the Musarum Oxonienseum Elioforia, the olive-bearing muses of Oxford, to commemorate the signing of the treaty. At the time, Locke, who'd earlier noted the presence in England of the Dutch and French diplomats in one of his letters, so he's clearly watching what was going on, was already a fellow of Christ Church College in Oxford, and he contributed two poems to this collection, one in Latin, the other in English. In Latin, he praised Oliver Cromwell as greater than either Augustus or Julius Caesar for ruling in peace that world he gained by war. In English, he equally extravagantly celebrated England's navy and its sailors, not for their victory over the Dutch, but rather for bringing peace by uniting opposites in an act reminiscent of the creation of the universe as described by Lucretius. If to make a world's but to compose the difference of things and make them close in mutual amity and cause peace to creep out of the jarring chaos of the deep, our ships do this, so that whilst others take their course about the world, ours a world make. This was not only Locke's first appearance in print. This particular volume was in fact the very first collection of poems published in Britain to commemorate a treaty. And this genre, the genre of treaty poems, uh, was again relatively new. I think the first one in continental Europe is no more than 10 years earlier than this one. The book itself was therefore evidence of a newly emergent treaty consciousness in the mid 17th century. A consciousness that again roughly coincided with the 1648 Peace of Westphalia, and that certainly helped to disseminate and to memorialize that moment, but which was not caused by those treaties, the 1648 treaties, and hence cannot strictly be called Westphalian in origin or in nature. International treaties and the ceremonies and celebrations accompanying them were still relatively rare events in Locke's lifetime, and they're worthy of celebration uh, when they happened. According to the online United Nations Treaty Database, there are currently in force now over 55,000 bilateral and multilateral treaties around the world. This worldwide web of treaties is a very modern phenomenon, the result of what one scholar has recently called the treaty-making revolution that really took off in the late 19th century, as you can see from this graph here. So here we are, 
uh, in Locke's lifetime, 1650s, and then the explosion of treaties. There's a brief explosion in the earlier part of the 19th century, but the upward trend, and it'd be way above the ceiling by, by now, uh, 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 really takes off in the late 19th century to uh, uh, lead us to where we are now with tens of thousands of treaties in force for all the major powers around the world. For comparison, again, from Locke's lifetime, we might note that when Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, in his capacity as arch archivist to Georg Augustus, the Elector of Hanover, uh, compiled a collection of treaties, the Codex Juris Diplomaticum, in 1693, rather than 55,000 treaties, it comprised just 224. Leibniz's collection may have been modest in size, but it was symptomatic of yet another novel genre from this period, uh, with which Locke would also be greatly engaged, that is, the genre of the treaty collection. That genre also began in the 1640s, when Locke was in his teens, and peaked in Britain, at least, in the year of uh, Locke's death, with the publication of the poet antiquarian Thomas Rymer's Foidera, again, treaties, uh, which was published um, perhaps not entirely coincidentally, by Locke's own publishers uh, who've been involved with its compilation since 1695. And this was the first state-sponsored collection of treaties ever published in Britain. Both, uh, Locke was both an early adopter of these novel genres and also an, uh, an intermittent consumer of them across his life. Collecting and reading treaties informed both Locke's practical activities as an administrator at various points in his life and his theoretical reflections as a philosopher, especially as a political philosopher. For a period in the 1660s, Locke was in fact something of a treaty broker, an agent and intermediary in the traffic in treaties that had been burgeoning since the 1640s. For example, when he spent a few months as a diplomatic secretary to the English envoy uh, in the northern German uh, principality of Cleves in 1666-67, to I'll return to this episode in a second, he wrote to the diplomat Sir William Godolphin back in England that he complied with a request to look out for a treaty collection. So he was clearly being tasked to find these materials, this novel genre, and send them back to his political masters in England. Locke had, in fact, uh, found a copy of one of the very first such volumes of treaties, uh, collected treaties, Johanna Andreas Ender and Christoph Peller's Theatrum Parkis of 1663, a comp compilation, <coughs> excuse me, a compilation of European treaties from 1646 to 1660, uh, which Locke complained was too big by half for its half high Dutch, German, as well as Latin. And it's a big, thick book like that. A few weeks later, a correspondent sent Locke manuscript copies of treaties between the electorate of Brandenburg and the Netherlands, and he subsequently apologised uh, to his masters for failing to procure copies of other Dutch treaties uh, at the time. So he's clearly, in this early moment of his uh, life as a diplomatic secretary, engaged in this trade, this traffic in treaties. By the late 1660s, the moment I'm talking about here, and for some years after, the English, book, the English book trade in particular had lagged behind its continental competitors in compiling treaties. There were no English language compilations of treaties at this moment. When Locke later returned to Europe uh, during his stay in France in 1675 to uh, 79, he continued trafficking treaties, uh, exchanging them with his correspondence there, and also was looking out for treaty-related uh, art, for instance. So in June 1677, uh, he went out to the Palace of Versailles, where he saw uh, the tapestry on which uh, this uh, print is based uh, by Charles Lebrun, uh, a Gobelin tapestry depicting Louis XIV making a lead with, the, with uh, the Swiss in 1663, and he comments on it in some detail in, in his journals at that time. A little later, in October 1677, uh, another one of his correspondents lamented to Locke how hard it was to find copies of, quotes, very scarce and voluminous treaties in England, uh, and asked if Locke, again, could go looking around in, in France uh, to find a, quotes, perfect collection uh, of such treaties, and Locke said it was actually very difficult to find exactly uh, what his correspondent was looking for, but he would continue the search none nonetheless. Again, fast forwarding a little bit to this, uh, the middle of the 1680s, when Locke was in exile in the Netherlands between 1683 and 1688. Uh, he stayed with a Quaker merchant named Benjamin Furley, who had a large private library, which included, you guessed it, lots of treaty compendia, which Locke would have had access to. Uh, 
And in the last years of his life in the 1690s and early 1700s, there's lots of evidence in Locke's correspondence of him writing to friends, writing to his publisher, uh, exchanging pamphlets, getting information about the, uh, the treaties that uh, uh, England in particular was engaging in uh, during uh, the wars, uh, uh, the, 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 the post-glorious revolution wars uh, of, of that period. Uh, he collected treaties for his personal library and even told a treaty joke in one of his letters. And I warn you, it's not an amazingly funny joke, but uh, it shows that he remembered uh, some, of, some of his early experience, he, where he teased an acquaintance, quotes that, if at this distance we should set out according to the forms of ceremony, our correspondence would proceed with a more solemn pace than the treaties of princes, and we must spend some years in the very preliminaries. That is, uh, he's re I think he's remembering uh, the episode, which I'll, I'll come back to in a second, in the 1660s when uh, he was involved in the beginnings, the laying the groundwork of diplomatic engagement, which didn't actually lead finally to a treaty in that sense of, again, the temporality of international politics politics as being slow, frustrating, and inconclusive, uh, he turns into um, uh, this not tremendously uh, hilarious joke with one of his friends about how their correspondence is spooling out at this point. Locke's political memory, like his library bookshelves, was amply stocked with treaties. His various, diplomatic, uh, various administrative duties as a diplomatic secretary in the 1660s, as a colonial administrator in the 1670s, and later, at the end of his life, as a high-ranking servant of the revolutionary state after the Glorious Revolution in the 1690s, presented a rich stock of experience for him to draw upon as he composed the two treatises and, indeed, as he revised them after their publication. So again, just to recap this a little bit, in his early 30s, as I mentioned, Locke acted as secretary to the English envoy Sir William Vane during his mission to the Elector of Brandenburg. This is... Um, uh, one of the letters uh, in, in Locke's own hand from, from that moment. His role in this, in this period was to handle all the incoming and outgoing correspondence of the embassy and to act as an intelligencer for the envoy, gathering information from around uh, the Brandenburg court, collecting whatever rumours and hard information he could find out about the progress of the elector's multiple treaty negotiations. The aim at this point was to keep the elector of Brandenburg on the English side, or at least neutral uh, in in uh, a uh, dispute with uh, the Dutch. And Locke wrote copious diplomatic letters. This is the largest body of unpublished material in John Locke's own hand, uh, which has never appeared either in his correspondence or in his collected works. It slumbers in the British National Archives, has never been uh, transcribed or, or edited. So again, if uh, anybody is looking for a, a master's or a doctoral project or uh, is interested in pursuing further scholarship on John Locke, uh, this is a marvelous opportunity to do that. He has very, very small handwriting, but it's exceedingly clear, which is a huge advantage uh, uh, for, for these purposes. So those winter months, in fact, again, remembering back to that moment at the Electoral Court, gave Locke a ringside seat to learn just how treaties were made, or indeed how they were not made in this case. And the memory of that moment, I think, uh, informs that, that later uh, treaty choke. He would have seen that it was rarely, if ever, sovereigns themselves who exercised the federative power. It was instead their agents, envoys and ambassadors, like his boss, Sir William Vane, along with their secretaries, like Locke himself, who were actually the instruments of the federative, just as executive power domestically flowed through the multifarious agents of the English state. This can, I think, help to explain why, 20, 25 years later, Locke insisted that the federative could not be determined by standing laws alone, but instead had to be left, quotes, in great part to the prudence of those who have this power committed to them to be managed by the best of their skill for the advantage of the Commonwealth. And again, he's not thinking of the king here, but he's thinking of the king's ministers, ambassadors, envoys, secretaries, the administrators and the agents beneath the sovereign, empowered by the sovereign, who engage in the daily work of diplomatic negotiation, of treaty making and treaty enforcement. As one of those to whom that power had been committed in that way, albeit at second hand, Locke was modest about his own capacity for deploying the federative. As he wrote in one letter, if my intelligence be not so considerable as you may expect, you will pardon it for my want of experience and language, not of will and endeavour. Mm -hmm. 
However, Locke's superiors didn't share this modest, expect, a modest estimation of his own diplomatic talents. Soon after he returned to England in, in 1666, he was offered the secretaryship to another English embassy, this time to Spain. Later that same year, uh, he was made another offer uh, to go back to uh, engage with the ele elector of Brandenburg, uh, sorry, to go to Sweden. And then in 1689, he was again uh, given the chance to become uh, an ambassador back to the Brandenburg court. Or indeed in 1698, six years before he died, uh, he had the chance to become secretary to the English ambassador here in Paris as well. Uh, so almost to the very end of his life, he's held in extremely high esteem by the king and the king's ministers as a diplomatic agent. Despite turning down those various diplomatic opportunities, Locke would spend months at a time in different administrative functions, gathering, shaping, and disseminating intelligence, information regarding the activities of the English crown and state and of its private and colonizing bodies in his bureaucratic capacities as secretary to the Board of, Trans uh, Board of Trade and Plantations in the 1670s, uh, this is one of the, the manuscript volumes of their, of their proceedings, uh, and later, as I've mentioned, as a member of King William III's Board of Trade in the 1690s, 1696 to 1700, the highest uh, rank that he ever took in the English state uh, after he'd published the two treatises of government. Treaty provisions frequently constrained or channeled the activities that he was dealing with in these various administrative roles, as claims to possession, territorial agreements, and commercial disputes turned up re repeatedly in the deliberations of the councils that he was involved with. For example, in 1673, when he was on the uh, Board of Trade and Plantations, uh, during, his, uh, uh, during this early period, Locke was involved in debate, debates uh, regarding the English right uh, to cut logwood in the Yucatan, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. The Spanish crown contested the English right to extract this valuable dye stuff under the terms of a treaty made in 1670 between England and Spain, uh, and Locke uh, and the board were uh, tasked with uh, deciding whether that Spanish uh, claim to keep out the English from the Yucatan was correct or not, so he had to delve deeply into the terms of that particular treaty and its application. Uh, 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 late, later on, he had to deal with similar disputes with the Dutch uh, around uh, Suriname in, in 1674, uh, and uh, he was asked, Locke himself was particularly asked, to work on a commercial treaty with Portugal around the same time. These are just a few examples of the kind of day-to-day -day administrative work that meant he was delving deeply into the details of treaties that had been made in the past and were held to constrain English activity, particularly around the Atlantic world, but also to write new treaties or to provide templates for new treaties uh, for new commercial relationships between England and other European powers. So the picture we have of Locke in these early years, the 1670s, is of an efficient, discreet, bureaucratic operator, trusted by his superiors to conduct sensitive business and skilled especially in the matter of treaties and their application. And that complements and indeed confirms our knowledge of his interest in treaties uh, in, in, uh, in Cleves in the 1660s, his later searching for treaty texts in the 1670s and beyond, and his continuing interest in treaties throughout the rest of his life. That interest in treaties was, however, not confined to Europe or the Atlantic world or to European sovereigns during this period. As a colonial administrator for the proprietors of Carolina, uh, that is a, 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 a chartered body uh, uh, colonizing what is now uh, North and South Carolina in the United States, uh, as the secretary to all the proprietors in the late 1660s and early 1670s, Locke became well aware that indigenous peoples in the Americas engaged in diplomacy or had a federative capacity, as he might later have said, and they expressed their sovereignty and equality with other sovereigns by making treaties. So in 1669, the proprietors produced a frame of government to, for their colony, the so-called Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina. As secretary to the proprietors, Locke was said by one of those proprietors to have had so great a hand in the original composition of the fundamental constitutions uh, that he was uh, then offered uh, a hereditary title uh, in the aristocracy of Carolina, a hereditary title that he in fact carried with him to his grave. Uh, 
a few years later, in 1682, he was involved in revising the fundamental constitutions. Uh, in fact, at just the moment when I think we can show he was finishing uh, chapter 5, the most famous chapter, the chapter of property in, in the Second Treatise of Government. Now, uh, what's relevant for our purposes here is that in the fundamental constitutions, uh, the proprietors of Carolina and Locke as their secretary twice acknowledge the autonomy of what they call the natives of that place, Carolina. Uh, the first uh, uh, time they acknowledge that was for the protection of their religious liberty and their diversity of beliefs. The second for their capacity to enter into agreements between sovereigns enumerated in quotes state matters, dispatches and treaties with the neighbor Indians and the ability of any of those neighbor Indians uh, uh, to make war, leagues and treaties with the English colonists themselves. The first of those principles that Locke laid out denied the paganism to justify the dispossession of Native Americans land. While the second principle, the more important one for our purposes here, affirmed that the Native Americans of Carolina expressed their sovereignty in just the same way as European sovereigns did. That is, by the use of the federative power, waging war, joining alliances, and making treaties. Some years later, in 1682 again, perhaps not coincidentally, Locke noted details from an early 17th century account of Native American diplomacy with the English in Virginia. Virginia which similarly recognized the equality of their intercultural, indeed international, relations when he noted uh, uh, what he called the peace made with the Chickahominy Indians in Virginia, who were a commonwealth. Those words are his, who were a commonwealth. And that word commonwealth is the, his synonym for state that he uses in the Second Treaty. So he recognizes, and the proprietors of Carolina recognize, the sovereignty, the state likeness, the federative capacity of in the indigenous peoples of Woodland North America in each of these instances. For Locke, therefore, indigenous peoples possessed a federative capacity, capacity for treaty making. They were thereby recognizable to European sovereigns as equal parties in contractual arrangements, especially if they could be reliable in their dealings with their treaty partners, something that he wrote about uh, elsewhere in this regard. Around the time that he was taking those notes about Virginia, again, we're talking about 1682, Locke was not only revising the fundamental constitutions of Carolina, but also probably revising and expanding the text which came to be known as the Second Treatise of Government. In that work again, Locke's account of the social contract emerging from the state of nature depended on the ability of those he called free, equal, and independent natural persons or individuals to make agreements with one another. If it were not possible for them to make such agreements, then it would be inconceivable that they could escape the state of nature to create a functioning commonwealth at all, could that, for that could only be done, quoting Locke again, by agreeing with some other men to join and unite in a community. The capacity for making agreements was thus a function of the pre-civil state carried over into civil society, just to reaffirm what I mentioned earlier. Indeed, 17th century Eng English recognized no distinction between an international negotiation and an interpersonal one. In late 17th century English, treaty in fact meant any negotiation and its result, the discussion leading to an agreement as well as the agreement itself. So just to take a couple of examples from Locke's letters, in one letter he wrote to his father about quotes, finding no disappointment at all in the delay of your treaty with a, doc with a doctor who was a friend of his father's. Or in another letter, he wrote to one of his female correspondents about a, quote, treaty of marriage between two English aristocrats. So the semantic range of the word treaty as a form of agreement and the process leading up to that agreement is actually much wider in 17th century English than the more constrained or constricted meaning of the term in contemporary 21st century English. Uh, where treaty means exclusively an international agreement. Though certainly when Locke talks about the federative capacity and leagues and alliances, he's talking about treaties in that more confined sense. Yet, as Locke well knew, making treaties in the diplomatic sense was one of the most distinctive marks of sovereignty. And as he was also well aware, what we might think of as modern, quotes, Weberian states were not the only wielders of such sovereignty. Shahs and sachems, corporations and federations 
all held sovereignty in the early modern period, and this in this regard it's notable that in his account of the formation of the social contract in chapter 8 of the second treatise, Locke made a rare excursion, rare for him, a rare excursion into the language of corporations. And here I quote chapter 8. When any number of men have so consented to make one community or government, they are thereby presently incorporated and make one body politic, wherein the majority have a right to act and conclude the rest with a power to act as one body. Such a description of an incorporation or a corporation, of course, describes primarily a commonwealth or state, among other commonwealth or commonwealths or states, but Locke's use of corporate language here, I think, is significant because it does not preclude construing other kinds of corporation, for example, the crown, universities, municipalities, or crucially, trading companies, for example, the Royal African Company, in which Locke invested in the 1670s, in similar terms. Indeed, it might particularly encourage seeing commercial corporations like the Royal African Company or the East India Company in exactly that way. So to talk about corporate bodies engaging with each other mostly refers to commonwealths or states, but not exclusively. And I think it opens the way for uh, an extension of Locke's own theory to include contemporary commercial corporations, even though Locke himself, to my knowledge only mentions one of those actually existing corporations once in his public works with a glancing reference uh, to the East India Company in one of his very late writings. He's not someone who uh, places a lot of stress on trading companies in his public writings, though he was investing in multiple companies uh, uh, in his financial dealings. The corporate body, he went on in, uh, in the second treatise, now stands, quote, in a state of nature with the rest of mankind and hence with regard to similarly incorporated entities. So imagine a world peopled by commonwealths or states, the kind of Weberian state we'd now recognize, but trading companies, corporations of different kinds, federations, and also all the indigenous sovereigns of North America, of Africa, of Asia, East and South, for instance. Like its analogues in the interpersonal state of nature, in the international state of nature, the whole community uh, is one body in the state of nature in respect of all other states or persons outside of its community, he says. That means it can enter into binding agreements with other similar entities, whether states or persons. This, again, is his language, uh, presumably including those corporate persons. Hence also, again, presumably, Locke's definition of, as the, of, of the federative, uh, again in chapter 12, as dealing with all persons and communities without the commonwealth. That could be individual persons, or it could be those corporate bodies which are impersonated, which have, as we would now say, legal personality, like, again, the East India Company or the Royal African Company. Now, Locke's account of the federative power in chapter 12 of the second treatise was, I think, therefore, not just an empirical description of the prerogatives of the English crown before and after the Glorious Revolution, though it's certainly that. It also implied a normative relationship between the social contract created by individuals, which brought them out of the state of nature into civil society, and the expanding network of agreements made by the several communities around the globe variously to determine the states of peace and war between themselves, to forge alliances, and as Locke says a little earlier in the second treatise, to settle, quotes, the bounds of their distinct territories. And so by compact and agreement, they settle the property which labor and industry began. So his famous theory of labor in chapter five of the second treatise, uh, although it refers to individuals in the state of nature, it also refers to persons, corporate persons, in the international state of nature as they carve up the surface of the earth to make boundaries between their uh, states in Europe and their colonial possessions outside Europe. However, Locke does distinguish uh, importantly between the social contract and the agreements uh, made between sovereigns. For, he says, for it is not every compact that puts an end to the state of nature between men, but only this one of agreeing together mutually to enter into one community and make one body politic. Other promises and compacts 
men may make with another and yet still be in the state of nature. So that describes the treaties and agreements which are made in the international state of nature, which don't create one single body politic, or to translate it into more modern terms, don't create a single world state uh, governing over all human beings and all human communities, uh, but rather uh, commonwealths or states and other corporate persons remain in a state of nature in relation to each other on the international stage in the same way that individuals have been in an interpersonal state of nature but have got out of it by making a social contract. Treaties were then like and unlike individual contracts. They were like individual contracts in that they, may, they could bind individuals to each other for particular purposes, but still left them in a state of nature with regard to one another. The international realm remained a state of nature between sovereigns of various kinds. They wouldn't execute a global social contract to create a global commonwealth ruling over all the peoples, sovereigns, corporations, and other bodies capable of making specific treaties with each other. In the late 1690s, again, this is going beyond the initial publication of uh, the two treatises of government. In the late 1690s, Locke returned to his engagement with sovereigns and their activities uh, when he joined the new Board of Trade uh, set up by King William III in 1696. In this bureaucratic capacity, Locke accumulated almost unparalleled knowledge of the diversity of English trade and product productivity, as well as familiarity with a selection of English trading companies and their competitors around the world, especially in the Atlantic world, but also into the Indian Ocean as well. The board's main interests outside Britain and Ireland were in North America and the Caribbean. In this capacity, Locke became the board's point person on a succession of matters concerning colonial governance and Atlantic commerce, including, for instance, tracking the activities of the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies, the so-called Darien Company, which was uh, pl planning to settle uh, the Isthmus of, Dan uh, of Darien on behalf of what was then the independent uh, Scottish uh, community and, and, and its parliament. And in the course of gaining information about that, uh, Locke uh, delves into the Spanish treaties in relation to Darien. Uh, he looks into the possibility of the indigenous peoples of Central America engaging in treaties with European powers and which treaties might still be in effect, whether the, the English uh, could break uh, off the Scots from their engagements with, with uh, um, the, uh, the Native Americans in the region, for instance. So again, he's going into multiple dimensions of treaty making and potential treaties uh, in, in, in this area. The board on which he was sitting was also occasionally asked to draft new treaties, uh, as in the case of a proposed treaty with France, uh, on which it spent multiple meetings in, 16, in 1697 in the run-up to the Treaty of Ricewick that year. Uh, and in that same year, 1697, the board's scope extended as far as the Middle East in relation to the vexing issue of piracy uh, when the discussions at Ricewick around uh, that treaty led to a proposal for a security pact among all the European powers uh, against piracy in the Red Sea. Pirates, uh, and this is from Locke's own notes on these discussions, pirates were not just dangerous to commerce but damaged the reputation of Christendom as a whole. These are European pirates act acting in the, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, in the words of the, uh, the Board of Trade drafted by Locke himself, the pirates, quotes, threaten the whole trade of Europe as well as render the Christian name odious throughout the whole world. The board proposed that the powers assembled in Ricewick should sweep the Red Sea clean of the menace by offering an amnesty to European pirates from uh, their own uh, respective countries. That novel suggestion didn't come to pass in the end, but it did mark an imaginative attempt, behind which stood John Locke, to exploit a treaty negotiation, the Treaty of Ricewick negotiation, for a larger collective goal of what he called the management of the security and interest of the public without England, without France, or outside the European powers. Perhaps not surprisingly, it came from Locke's own pen, uh, the pen, that is, of the member of the board who had the longest record of engagement with treaties and experience of the federative in action, John Locke himself. Once the Treaty of Ricewick had been finally agreed, without, even, without including that pen to combat piracy, Locke was among the members of the council who relayed an order across the Atlantic for publishing the Peace of Ricewick to bring an end to colonial hostilities between the English and the French. So, to draw to a conclusion now,
In light of Locke's varied and great engagement with treaties in the 30 years before he published the two treatises, as well as in his activities in the 15 years when they circulated in print in three different editions, we might now be able to see more clearly what was at stake in his description of the federative power in chapter 12 of the second treatise. That power is an extension of the ability of individuals in the state of nature to engage in agreements with one another. It was at root a pre-civil capacity that preceded the civil state, but continued into it and beyond it, and one that characterized both relations among natural persons uh, before they had a sovereign, and relations among artificial persons, states and other commonwealths, such as the polities of indigenous peoples, as well as trading corporations, for instance, those artificial persons who were still in a state of nature with regard to one another. The federative power pre-existed even the institution of legislative institutions and persisted in their absence, whether temporary or otherwise. Unlike, for example, the persistence of the power of punishment uh, from the state of nature into civil society, which Locke famously described in the Second Treatise as a, quote, strange doctrine, there was nothing odd, I think, about the primacy or the durability of the federative power. It was, if anything, the defining mark of collective sovereignty, that is, as the power to contract had similarly defined individual autonomy. What was strange about it was that Locke distinguished it at all and that it subsequently attracted so little attention. Locke's novel account of the federative power, in fact, fell on entirely stony ground. I have not found any contemporary discussion of it, it did not catch on within similar tripartite discussions of the division of powers later. And Locke's very neologism, federative, was entirely forgotten, at least with this meaning, to be replaced by Montesquieu's reinvention of the term in his description of the République Federative in L'Esprit des Lois of 1748. Something quite different. Indeed, Locke's discussion of the federative seems to have had no discernible afterlife except perhaps from one possible glancing and rather dismissive reference in Rousseau's social contract. And here I quote Rousseau. Our politicians, unable to divide sovereignty in its principle, divide it in its object. They divide it into force and will, into legislative and executive power, into rights of taxation, justice and war, into domestic administration and the power to conduct foreign affairs. I think he may be referring to Locke there. Locke's idea of the federative may nonetheless be worth resurrection as a reminder that in the hands of its inventor, it denoted, denoted a more expansive capacity for autonomous and binding interaction than its later users might have acknowledged, encompassing the actions of indigenous peoples and corporations, as well as those of self-identified modern or civilized actors. Locke's own experience as diplomatic secretary and bureaucratic administrator would have shown him that what he called the prudence of those who have this power committed to them, demanded by the federative, was not solely the prerogative of the sovereign, but had to be exercised in tentacular fashion by the sovereign's various agents. The federative, that is, I think, was at least productive as it was puzzling, for three reasons. First, because we can see how it linked Locke's own political experience and knowledge uh, and his uh, uh, administrative and management activities to his theoretical elaborations and indeed his theoretical innovation in this particular regard. Secondly, it reminds us that the practice of treaty making uh, 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 was a precedent or a model for the elaboration of the social contract tradition. That is, that the federative capacity, the capacity to make treaties, preceded the contractual capacity. And I think that opens up much wider possibilities for thinking about the roots of the social contract tradition as something that arises from a long prehistory of treaty-making activity rather than treaty-making activity as being modeled upon the social contract tradition itself. And thirdly and finally, in a long durée perspective, uh, I think uh, Locke's treatment of the federative is also a reminder of the conservatism of British institutions, which even in the age of Brexit are still adequately described by Locke's account of the separation of powers and indeed of the location of the federative power, uh, which he wrote now one third of a millennium ago.